So, no. Johan, thank you very much for taking the time to sit with me and have this conversation. I appreciate it a lot. Today, um, ladies and gentlemen, as you would know, um, Johan Abrams is a phenomenal uh, person. So I have a phenomenal guest on, on our podcast today. Um, Johan was for many years uh, the, ex uh, the executive producer of Special Assignment in SBC 3. So I think many of us growing up, especially my age, enjoyed Special Assignment um, uh, on SBC, something that we always look forward to. You also have uh, degrees from the USA and South Africa. He is a award-winning journalist and recently he researched, he wrote and directed the Khoi Khoi Saga, a series about the Khoi Khoi uh, in South Africa. I could go on and on, uh, but we will run out of time. So, Johan, uh, welcome uh, to Abrasive Conversations. Thank you for that uh, for that intro. It's <laughs> Sometimes I feel, you know, uh, it's a bit, it's a bit too much. <laughs> so when I was doing research um, um, about you, uh, I, I, I was like, literally, this is a book. This is supposed to be a biography. So um, I'm looking forward to the the biography coming. So talking about the biography, Johan. So let's start off the uh, start at the beginning. Uh, please tell me a little bit more about yourself. At a young age, I, I knew that I was interested in, I think I was about six, seven years old. I already knew that I, that, that, um, I wanted to make movies. Um, obviously, it was not at the right time for us uh, as black people. Um, there was no industry, even in South Africa yet. Um, but very soon after I started, I, I went into teaching at first. And then uh, as soon as I, I, I had enough funding, I, it was also the era of, of video that started in the 80s. I, I bought equipment and I started making my own programs. Uh, obviously, at that stage, you know, it wasn't broadcast. It was mainly doing uh, community television stuff uh, shot on, on, on VHS. And um, for people like uh, churches would hire me. Um, or schools would hire me to film their special events, and people would hire me to do their weddings. So that's how it started for me. And then um, I, got, I was lucky to get a scholarship, and I went to the US, and um, I did my first degree there, my undergrad, uh, with a focus on broadcast news, um, because that's what the university offered, and uh, I was also into film school. So I did a double major. And it suited me well because it was, you know, in the one stage, on the one end, it was uh, the, uh, 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 learning about documentary filmmaking, and then in the, in the film school also about feature filmmaking, camera work, and all that. Um, so then I I came back to South Africa. I worked there for a while at a TV station there, working um, in the news department. Um, and in the states, you work as a, what they call a video journalist. So I started, you know, I was I was already exposed there to going out and finding stories, writing, uh, shooting your own story, and uh, and writing your own story. Uh, when I came back to this to South Africa, it was post because uh, I voted in, in. I remember I voted in in, in Chicago, and shortly afterwards in May, um, just before June, I came back to South Africa. Um, to um, uh, and then uh, joined SABC uh, late in 1994, and then my career took off in, in, in mostly in broadcast, which was not my intention initially. Um, I ended up with like I said with special assignment in 2004, and it helped me to also you know hold my skills in in filmmaking. Um, doing current affairs, um, doing investigative dockies, what news documentaries. Um, yes, and in 2011, I, I, I felt the time is right for me to jump off, jump ship, um, and to do my own stuff, uh, be bold enough to, 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 to work for myself, find stories, 
find people that were will, that was willing to pay for, uh, for the product, um, and that's when I went freelance. Uh, but you know, when it's freelance, you obviously you're back with broadcasters because now um, it's it's easier to sell news documentaries and current affairs stories to the SABC and to ETV, and that's what kept me going. But at the back of my mind, I always wanted to do feature documentaries and feature films. Um, so the idea, uh, so we've been working on this coin saga for a long time before it finally came to fruition in 2000, in 2016, 2017, we started filming. So um, I just want to go a little bit back um, in the journey uh, before we get to the Koi Koi saga, because reading through and doing research about you is, is almost like there were steps and you were almost there at most of the important kind of events that took place in South Africa. So one of the things that you mentioned uh, is that you came back in May 1994. Now, if if people are old enough or they they, they can still remember that the May 10th, 1994 was the kind of historic day when Nelson Mandela became the the president, the first black president of South Africa. And next to him, you had Thabo Mbeki and, and, and F.W. Declare. So, so you came back right at that cusp, but it was a very inter interesting period in South Africa. So now, now that you have time and you've moved away a little bit from the SABC, um, which would, which are some of the everlasting stories um, that you kind of covered um, uh, uh, kind of the post-1994 era that, that, that you would say this one stood out for me. People might not know it, but I was quite in, involved in that particular story. Funny enough, uh, yeah, I came back after Mandela became president. I, I, came, I think it was really at the end of May because I think we were watching together as South Africans. We were watching the uh, inauguration or the uh, Mandela becoming president on TV there. Uh, I was even doing a story about, because I was from South Africa, I could do stories there from about this, the transition and using my own friends there. Uh, so I did a film about them traveling to Chicago to go and vote for the first time, which is quite significant. Um, coming back here, when I arrived here, I was at first I didn't I I didn't have work for a few months. I only joined the SABC late in nineteen ninety four. But the the stories that um, I think um, stood out for me um, was you know we've heard of Mandela and then suddenly I had this opportunity to travel as a journalist around the country uh, and also to meet Mandela and to film him, meeting people and the impact he had on people. Um, I, I remember he was in Friedendal. Uh, we, we covered the story of him visiting that community and many other communities. And, and that was significant at the time. And also interesting for me, one of the highlights for me was actually filming um, Prince Charles and Harry, when Harry was a kid, coming to South Africa, it was one of the first visits, or state visits almost, um, that I saw. And and the SABC put me and another journalist on on that trip, on that um, uh, on the on the whole on the whole visit to South Africa. So we, even though there are journalists in Joburg and in Durban, PE everywhere, they chose two of us to follow Charles around the country. So we flew with him, not with him, but you know, on the, around the, uh, the country uh, to each of the places that they visited. And so that was quite significant for me and the feather in the cap, I think, that I was chosen to, 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 to be a cameraman slash videographer at the time. Because um, I worked with a with report on that. We visited everywhere. Uh, or the whole country with them, including um, um, at a concert in Joburg at Alice Park, uh, where the Spice Girls were performing. But it was interesting. Um, it was an interesting time. Um, but but 
political i i steered away from politics um i i got into doing um a lot of crime stories uh, including which was interesting the trial of the station strangler uh, who was arrested while I was in America. He was arrested in April, I think. So when I came back, I was part of a team that followed the court case, which started late to, uh, which started in 95, I think. And the stories I covered in those early years were a lot of stories like taxi wars, shacks that burned, and, you know, nothing glamorous about it. But um, it was interesting and I enjoyed the the rush of journalism but in the back of my mind there was always the idea this is not really what I wanted to do I really need to make movies and I want to do documentaries feature documentaries where you spend a lot of time on it but um, yes it was an interesting time in our history uh, that that 1994-95 era. I can still remember because I'm from a small town just nearby Butterfontein, so I know of the yeah. houses and the and, and and the and the people that went all of this uh, to Fredendal that day, and and people were sitting on top of the well, the the lamp. Yeah. It was it was quite a big yeah. event. Uh, so it was a hot day. It was yeah. A it was a very day. it was a very hot day. So so I can still remember that day vividly. Um, I was I was in high school at that. At that, that that time, so yeah, amazing so how uh, it's amazing how that story uh, you were part of the coverage, but um, that I was there, and that and that's the other thing uh, is that sometimes we don't know how we intersect and how we cross each other's yeah, life exactly. over uh, exactly. over over a period of time. But um, yeah. before we go into um, the your your Hanandal, which you call your spiritual. Home, there is something uh, that I want to pick up on is you pick challenging stories and, and, and you've covered some conflicts. Uh, and, and the ones that stood out for me while doing research is is kind of the Rwanda um, mm. type of, of violence and things that, that is the, that happening there. So was this by choice or was this a specific design? Because mm. there's this, I, I could see this trend is that the stories that you pick or uh, that you were involved in was history making, but was also challenging. The Rwanda story, um, I was assigned to go to Rwanda to to be part of the 10 year. Um, it happened in, in it happened in 2000, uh, in 1994, right? The massacres. Yeah. So I think this 10 years after the massacres that I was there. Um, and um, it was, I was part of a contingent of SABC journalists and South African government. And uh, um, uh, yeah, there was a whole delegation of government as well. So what what stood out for me there, there was the stories of the atrocities uh, we filmed survivors, um, like in, in one case, it was a woman who lost her whole family. Her parents and her siblings all died in one day. Uh, so those stories were amazing um, uh, to cover. And the whole, the whole, the whole time there was, was quite a, a something which stayed, stayed with me for a long time and still stayed with me today. I know there are a lot of South Africans that, that love Benny Hinn. But we went there to explicitly to go and look at what we believed was a scam. Um, and it was for special assignment that I went to to cover that. And the idea was to go and find out the whole uh, behind Benny, in, you know, the story behind it. Um, is this, is the, what, what makes him so popular? And, and also, is it a scam? And, and how are they scamming the people? So we find it was not pretty what I found. It, most of it is very difficult to expose. Uh, we were kept away from him for, they stayed in a six, seven star hotel and, and, and you couldn't get close to the hotel. Also, when he lands, when he, when he comes to the event, 
He comes with a chopper and you are kept away with guys with guns uh, until he's on stage. And then even, I mean, they were beating people uh, when they come too close to him. So it was very difficult to tell the story, but eventually we got something out. Um, and it's just interesting how people believe in in in, in the what they. Uh, it's a sort of a gospel. It's a it's a what prosperity gospel that they preach in, and how people latched onto that because of the poverty. I mean, these people give their last money when I mean, they when they sit around the 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 plate of offerings, uh, people put in their last money. Um, and and I, 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 I was actually disgusted, actually, when I looked at it, how these people um, in their fancy clothes come and they take the last bit of money from from ordinary, ordinary Nigerians who hope for a miracle. I think I called the story In Search of a Miracle. And I fo followed somebody around that went to to this event in order to receive a miracle, which obviously didn't happen. So it's a sad story, but it's typical of stories that I like to do about the downtrodden, the people, the underdog. Uh, it's common, you know, that journalists often go for that, and I'm also one that um, always look at at the story from that angle. Now I want us to go to Hanandal, which is your spiritual home. So one of the things that I actually enjoyed reading was your, was, was your thesis um, that you submitted uh, for uh, at, at UCT. So uh, um, I read the thesis and, 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 and the thesis is kind of almost a bio, biographical work uh, because you, you reveal quite much in that. And so one of the stories that was, I think one of the, stories or, or or the films that you um that you made i think was coming home um uh, and in your thesis you call hanarnal your spiritual home um it's it's also your kind of ancestral home where you're coming from um mm. but the time that you kind of make that connection there was a fight um in hanarnal uh, mm. about the ancestral land and and retaining um the the ancestral land so Please tell us uh, more about the significance of Hanadendal and why it's such an important place in South South Africa's history. I was I was born in Port Elizabeth. Uh, my dad was in a part of the Moravian setup um, as a minister, and he did his seminary. Uh, he went to the seminary before I was born. When just when he got married, he he, he they moved the family moved to PE, uh, Kabecha. Uh, to to do is uh, to to be at the seminary. With the seminary was in PE at the time, and that's where I was conceived and born. So I was three years old when when we left PE to come back to to Cape Town. So I I have no connection to to Berga. I've you know when I go there, I I like walking around there. And thinking back on the family and the fact that I was born there, but there's no connection. My, my connection with a play, if I have to have a connection, it is Hanadendal. Because my mom was from Hanadendal and my father. Both are, have that connection. My mom was born in Hanadendal. I think my father wasn't born in Hanadendal, but he grew up there. Uh, and all the family, his family, they all re, uh, re, um, were from Hanadendal. Uh, my my father's grandfather and great grandfather, which is my great great grandfather, they all went to the same to the Hanandal um, Quick School, as they call it, the old uh, um, seminary in Hanandal, the trained teachers and ministers. Um, yes, and now the significance of Hanandal or the so at a young age, I my awareness was always that Hanandal is a special place because of the um, Moravian mission station status. It's the oldest mission station uh, in South Africa. I think almost on the southern part of the continent, it's the oldest. It's the first place where missionaries came in and, and started working with the indigenous people to um, 
uh, to Christianize them and to teach them to read and write. Now, I'm very critical of that as well when you watch the Koi Saga. But, um, but, but growing up and with all that innocence, for me, it was a special place. It was where, you know, it, it, and this is, and the significance was that my people are from there. And uh, I knew that I was Koi descendant, even though, you know, growing up, uh, we already, I already bought into that, uh, the fact that we are Koi, Koi descendants, because our uncles used to tell us all these stories about where we come from. And then the German connection, the Vessels fam surname, because my mother was a Vessels, and uh, her, her father, or her grandfather, or great grand, I think it's seven, seven, seven um, generations before my mom. Uh, that's where the vessels surname came in from uh, a German farmer who had uh, a child with a Kanandal woman. It's obviously a Koi woman, and um, she named her child Jonas Vessels. And seven, eight generations later, there's. I am eight generations later. Um, and then my on my father's side, even though he's Abrams, but he, the Abrams comes from from my grandmother who was, who, who married uh, an Abrams from Toast River. Mm -hmm. But my father's actually, the, the, the family name is, is Yonker. And there's a long line of Yonkers who who are uh, um born and lived in Ghanadanda. And ironically, my father's grave is in Mamre, next to his great-grandfather's grave, who was also a Moravian minister. Um, and his name was Joshua Yonker. So, yeah. Um, so there was a deep awareness of Ghanadanda as a special place, as a, as a place where my father used to tell us, you know, it's the first, it's the oldest bridge in South Africa, it has the it has a lot of firsts. It was the first, um, it's the oldest uh, mill, working mill, in the country. Um, the first school schooling took place in Ghanadendal. The first teachers, black teachers, were trained in Ghanadendal, black and white. The first teachers in on South African soil were trained in Ghanadendal. The oldest crash is in Canada. The idea of a crash started in Canada. I don't know. There's there's so many firsts that you can look at. Um, um and, and it's all now the thing is it's all because of Germans that came there and started a lot of the projects. Um which which is the positive side, but there's also the negative side, which I only became aware of later, uh, which I'm not gonna go into now, or if you want me to talk about it later. All right, so one of the things um, that is often ignored is where the anti-apartheid struggle actually took place. It, it didn't just take place in your major cities, like your um, Joburg and your Pretoria and your Cape Towns or your, your PE at the time, but also in places um, like Hanandal, because uh, your family were deeply involved in the anti-apartheid uh, fight. Um, and many of the leaders, um, like you already mentioned, like Chris Vessels is part of your family and Chris Nissen. But there's people like uh, Henry Bredenkamp and Isaac Bailey that is also from uh, Hanardendal. Um, they come from there. So what do you think a uh, um, cultural uh, spirit of resistance against colonialism and apartheid? Because you already mentioned is that... Um, uh, the Khoi of, of uh, and I know what the Khoi of Kanadandal were not Doshal people. They 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 resisted even colonialism and the the Moravian. So they kind of form Kanadandal in a way that worked for them. So, but what do you think culture that kind of resistance, spirit of resistance against colonialism and apartheid? Let me take you back to one uh, that people often don't talk about. Um, and 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 my my thinking is that you know that uh, uh, spirit of resistance, I'm sure it filtered down because of those people. Um, there's there's um, there's somebody that nobody mentions, and his name is Jan Perl. I don't know if you read about him, Professor Russell. 
uh, Professor Russell uh, Falyun did the research and wrote about it. And I, I read the book and I'm in awe of his story. Who And people don't know, even people in Ghanandal don't know, that he lived in Ghanandal for most of his life. He, even though he was in Swellendam and he led the uprising there, he, he, he was under house arrest at the time in Stellenbosch area after the failed uh, rebellion. And then he came to live in Ghanandal with his son and his other kids followed after his wife died in Stellenbosch. So he lived in Ghanana for, I think, 50 years. He was like in his late 40s, I think, when he moved to Ghanana. And he was almost 90 when he died. And and he played a significant role in Ghanandal's, uh, in, 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 in Ghanandal at the time. Um, and surely he must have spoken about these things uh, when he was there. Um, now, now, let's move forward to... Um, to, to the more recent past. Uh, first of all, I actually wanted to also talk about, there was there was uh, one of my my mother's cousins, um, uh, Dan Moose Vessels, and people should research him. Uh, Daniel Moose Vessels, they, they used to call him Da Moose. He was a big, imposing figure with a white little beard and with a, a loud voice. He used to, at political rallies, Buta, we used to call him Buta Dan. But the Dan didn't need a microphone. You know, when there's a mic, he ignores the mic and he speaks to the people, you know, in that booming voice of his. Um, and he was part of the... Uh, they were not ANC, they were New Unity Movement people. Um, and, you know, they were uh, much more radical than the ANC even. So uh, most of my family was actually New Unity Movement. So it's like, uh, but the Dan, then his son, Victor Vessels, that people forgot about. Uh, Victor was under house arrest for most of his life. The son, Dennis Vessels. Dennis was given an exit permit. He was banned from the country. And he, he lived in England and died in England. Uh, he came to Buta Dan, his dad's funeral in the 70s. I still took pictures. You know, I already had this journalism thing on me. Uh, I took pictures of the funeral. And I remember Dennis came under police escort to his dad's funeral. Wow. From, at the time, D.F. Malan. Escorted to the funeral. Immediately after the funeral, he was taken back to the airport and back out of the country. And that was around 74, 75. I'm not sure about the date, but it was early 70s. Uh, but the dad, when he died, he died shortly after his ban was lifted. He was under a a ban, he can't be with more than his house, uh, a ban uh, where he's not allowed to be with more than three people in his presence. Wow. And when the ban was lifted, he died shortly afterwards. So there was them and then Uncle Chris, um, um, who was also, you know, who also spent time in prison and, and used the pulpit to fight the government, speaking from the pulpit. Um, so, um, all that I, I think it, it's the culture of uh, Henry, Henry Brilkham, uh, uh, Jati, as we call him, uh, uh, uh Isaac Bali, who in his way, uh, collected all those artifacts and all of that. Um, I think all of them, all of them contributed, um, to, in an immense way, but I think also the fact that the first school was there. The, the first um, the first training school for teachers and the first primary school was there in the country. Uh, that kind of education uh, or level of education that, that was way in the 1800s, I think all of that contributed to a consciousness um, and, and, and filter down in the descendants that we, um, we are a people, a people with a history. And and we are being uh, subjected to this um, evil of apartheid. I uh, remember they 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 removed the school, the, the the training school, and that was a huge thing for the people of Hanandal when they closed the doors of the teachers training college. Um, not the people of Hanandal only, but for coloured people 
at the time colored. And remember, it's not just colored. Uh, all Africans, all black people were allowed into that school. A lot of them were trained there. Let's talk about Khoi Khoi and, and, and the state of, of the Khoi Khoi people in South Africa. But let's start with you. Because you are open, and like you said, your uncles um, already told you openly where you come from and, and, and who you are. So, so you are very open about your your, your ancestry, um, and you have already mentioned in your thesis that it can be traced back all the way back to George Smith in in 1783. Um, was this always the case, uh, or is uh, is this something uh, that you later kind of said, okay? Because there was the colored cl- colored classification after 1950, where all of the the other identities were were erased. If you were Khoi Khoi, even if you were Khrikwa, Nama, uh, Bushman, you were erased and you were put into this colored category, and then people were forced into this particular category. And and this is the question why I'm asking you: Was it always the case um, that that your Khoi Khoi identity was so strong? My you know, ironically, it was while I was in the States that my Koi um, consciousness actually became strong. Prior to that, I mean, we were quite happy to be called colored. Nobody questioned, I mean, nobody questioned it. But we had a, we had a knowledge that we, that we were Koi descendants. That was never a question. We often spoke about it um, um, at home. And uh, uh, my father was, besides um, a teacher and and, and also a Moravian minister, um, he was also a historian, studied history. He, that was his major um, um, university with, um, um, at UNISA. He, he did, his major was history and he was he did his uh, honors, and he, I think he passed away when he was his master's. So he was a history buff, and um, for him was the stuff he wrote about was always about the coin. But my my consciousness became strong, or became, or I became sort of passionate about it when I was in the states. Ironically, because when I met. Um, Native Americans, um, and and I was drawn, you know, towards these people, towards the Native Americans and the plight of the Native Americans while I was there, and I lived in uh, in 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 in, in um, my the university I went to was the University of Kansas, which is in the middle of nowhere in the states, close to Kansas City, and uh, I I consciously attended. Um, powwows and um, celebrations that the Native Americans had in that area in Wichita and and in um, um, Topeka and in Kansas City um, and in Lawrence where I lived the town Lawrence Kansas where I lived uh, they often had celebrations now I remember there's Columbus Day and I remember I filmed and I did a story about them celebrating Columbus Day. Um, you know, the resistance to Columbus Day. Uh, they didn't have a problem with the day, but they, 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 for them it was, I remember for them it was the end of the, the end of their tribal life, just like Jan van Riebeek's arrival here. For them, Columbus was a similar event that spelled the death of their tribal life and their prosperity. Um, so, so they it was a day of mourning for them, and they celebrated that. And I covered a story like that. Also, um, in America, they have they have these um, football teams, um, uh, American rugby, American rugby teams, and then there's the one team called the, the Chiefs. And people go, you know, when they score a touchdown, people go, uh, 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 they sing. And they have these fake tomahawks, and they all go like this with a tomahawk, and people are dressed in in feathers, and uh, many Native Americans don't like that, but it's ignored because they are a minority. Um, 
and this marginalization of the of the of the Native Americans is something that really bothered me while I was there. Um, I would speak about it in class when I was a student there, and the other students couldn't get it. You know, they just couldn't get it that um, that they are doing uh, like the the team in Washington, not Washington D.C., but the state of Washington. It's called the Washington Redskins. I mean, that's an insult. So um, I think they've changed that. <laughs> and there's, there's there's some other teams, uh, uh, you know, linked to Native American names, Apache or whatever, Cherokee, uh, that they use with um, just the way they want to. And, and and that bothered me. And But it made me value my Koi ancestry. And I saw that when I go to towns there, I want to hear more about the history of the Native Americans. And I thought, but back home, we are also invisible. 